Hey everyone, this is Mike from vSwitch Zero. So I've been trying to think of something a little different to do for December. And as you may or may not know, I've worked for VMware now for over a decade. So any opportunity to mix retro computing and modern virtualization kind of stuff is always an exciting prospect. So today I'm going to create an MS-DOS 6.22 virtual machine and VMware workstation. I'm going to go over the whole nine yards. So installation, setup, memory management, sound, CD-ROM, networking, you name it. So it's probably going to be a pretty long in-depth video. And of course it would not be a retro PC video if I didn't run Doom at least once. So if you have uh, enough patience to get through this long video at the end, you will see some Doom running in a, in a VMware virtual machine. So I'm going to be using VMware Workstation Pro for this um, today. Uh, version 16, I believe, is, is what's current. Um, Workstation Pro is a paid product. You can run it uh, in both Windows and Linux, but um, you don't have to run VMware Workstation. You can use VMware Workstation Player, which is a free trimmed down version of Workstation. Um, it does most of the basic things that you would need to create a create and run a virtual machine. The only thing that I think you might have a problem with is there's some limitations in display output. So DOS does have um, you know some lower resolution output and you might see things in a very small window unless you lower the resolution of your your host machine whereas VMware Workstation Pro allows you to stretch things out. So aside from that you can definitely use this or if you want you can run the uh, trial version of Workstation Pro which I believe you get a, a 30 day uh, trial period so you can definitely do that as well. And of course if you're running a Mac there's a different product called VMware Fusion that you can use as well. So you may be wondering why you'd even want to do this when there are great tools out there like DOSBox. DOSBox is an open source tool that emulates a 486 DOS machine and all of its components, including VGA card, sound card, etc. So DOSBox works really well and can even tweak the emulated CPU speed so that it can run speed sensitive games and applications. And in most situations, you should be running DOSBox, not a DOS virtual machine. DOSBox also lets you mount a location directly on your machine. You don't have to create a virtual disk or anything like that. You also can, you know, very conveniently just start using it as soon as you install it. You don't have to set it up. You don't have to load drivers. You don't have to do memory management and things like that. So a virtual machine is very different. Yes, there are emulated devices in a VM like video cards and network cards. But access to the CPU is virtualized, not emulated, and that's really the key difference. So this means that the DOS VM will quite literally have direct access to the CPU and all of its features. This is both a blessing and a curse sometimes, because modern CPUs are just not well suited to run software that's 30 years old. But unlike DOSBox, we can install a real operating system in the virtual machine. DOS 6.22 in its original form, along with all of its bugs and quirks, will be installed into the virtual disk, and it'll be interacting directly with my modern CPU. We'll just still need to do all the same setup and memory management tweaks that we need to do on a physical DOS machine. All right, so I'm in VMware Workstation here. I've got no virtual machines to find at all yet. So I'm just gonna go up to File and New Virtual Machine, and we're gonna use the Custom Advanced option because we want full control over how we configure this machine. For the compatibility version, so this is the VMware uh, hardware version um, that you can specify. It basically just defines uh, what types of virtual hardware you can have, as well as limitations for, you can see over here, the amount of memory, number of processors, and things like that. With DOS, obviously, we are not pushing any limits whatsoever, so it really doesn't matter too much. The only reason you'd really want to pick an older version is if you plan to move this uh, virtual machine to another machine with an older version of Workstation or a different VMware product, for example. But uh, for our purposes here, you can I'm just going to pick the latest, and you can do the same here. So just go next. And we're going to install the operating system later. Workstation does allow you to sort of feed it an ISO file and it'll sort of walk you through things. But again, we want to do everything as manual as possible here. So for guest operating system, uh, MS-DOS is actually under other. So there's a few less common operating systems here. So we're going to go ahead and choose that. When you select the operating system version, this doesn't technically matter too much, but all it does is make sure that the correct default hardware types and uh, limits are sort of observed when you create the machine. And for the virtual machine name, this is just for your own purposes. I'm just going to call it MS-DOS, and this is the location it's stored. By default, there's a folder called virtual machines in your uh, documents folder. You can change it if you want to store it somewhere else, but I'll just accept the defaults. And processors for DOS is important. It's uh, You just want one. DOS is not really a proper 
multiprocessor operating system, so we'll just stick with that. And for memory, you can see by default it picks 16 megs. That's a good size for pretty much anything in DOS. I believe DOSBox as well by default uses 16 megs, so we're just gonna stick with that number. And for the network connection type, so this is kind of important. By default, Workstation always suggests to use NAT for, for uh, your VMs, and this basically just puts, puts the machine behind NAT on your uh, host machine. So in a sense, you're basically gonna be sharing your physical NIC, but from the virtual machine's perspective, you're behind NAT, so you're gonna have a, a different 192.168.random number address. Um, the problem with NAT is that if you do wanna access your VM, from your home network. Uh, because it's behind NAT, it won't work. This is really good if you just wanna be able to give your virtual machine internet access and not really worry about uh, anything else. But since we're gonna be you know, setting up an FTP server and some other things with this, we wanna use bridge networking. And when you use bridge networking, you're basically just going to get an IP address on your home network uh, in the same subnet. So your, your router, whatever you have dishing out IPs via DHCP will actually give your virtual machine the address. So I'm gonna use this. It's a little more like a true machine sitting on your network in a sense. So for the SCSI controller type, this doesn't matter too much because I don't think we're gonna be using a SCSI controller uh, in DOS, but I believe you have to select one here. So we'll just use bus logic. You'll see later on, it's gonna be an IDE disk. So this doesn't really matter too much. And yeah, here it's asking what virtual disk type we want. So it's important we select IDE for DOS because that's what, uh, what we'll want to do. And we're going to create a new virtual disk because we don't have one currently. And you can see that Workstation picks two gigs as the default size. And that's because FAT16 and MS-DOS, that partition type, it has a maximum size of two gigs. So it's a good number to, to choose there. Um, I've had issues, I don't I can't remember if it was with Workstation, but uh, sometimes it's actually a little bit bigger than two gigs when you actually look at it in FDisk, and then you get some size left over. So I don't really need two gigs. I'm just gonna make it like 1.8 or something like that. Doesn't really matter, but that's fine. Um, you can allocate all disk space now if you want, but then you're gonna have a 1.8 gig uh, uh, file within your virtual machine directory. You don't need to do that. Uh, as long as you've got solid state storage on your host machine, uh, you're not going to worry about fragmentation or anything like that, so don't bother checking that. You'll just waste disk space. The uh, second option here, store virtual disk as a single file. This is really just for portability purposes. If you do want to move this, you know, USB drives, depending on how they're formatted, have file size limits, so it just sort of chops up the virtual disk into smaller size files. We're only dealing with 1.8 gigs here, so I'm just going to store it as a single file. I believe there are some performance advantages, too, if you go with that route. And the disk's file name always ends in VMDK. That's the file extension, so that's fine. We'll just leave it. By default, it's just the name of the virtual machine .vmdk. And that's it. So now we've got a summary here. So I'm just gonna hit finish now, but we're not done yet. Uh, so yeah, here's the summary page of the virtual machine. You can see some of the hardware that we've defined over here. But I'm gonna edit the virtual machine because there's a few changes I wanna make before we proceed. So the first thing we wanna do is under display. So we wanna make sure you're not accelerating 3D graphics. That's not gonna work well with DOS anyway, so that's fine. And we don't want to, because we're sort of trying to mimic an older machine here, we don't wanna give it too much VRAM. So if we specify the monitor settings, we're gonna just make sure that, you know, a lower common DOS resolution is picked here. So the maximum we can do is 1024 by 768 or something like that. And I believe that just limits the amount of VRAM that the virtual machine sees, so that should uh, make it a little more compatible in some cases. So that's good. And you'll want to do stretch mode as well, because DOS, I mean, by default, the, you know, the 720 by 400 or whatever VGA resolution is the, the normal one. It's going to look really small unless you stretch it out. So I like to turn on stretch mode, and we're going to keep the aspect ratio um, so that it doesn't, you know, get really, really stretched wide. That'll at least make it look a little bit better. And was there something else we were gonna do over here? I think that's it. Oh, actually, one very important thing I almost forgot. So we have to add a floppy drive to this. And when you add a floppy drive, you have the option of either connecting it to a physical floppy drive in the system. And obviously most people don't have this anymore, so I don't have one on the list. But it does allow you to use floppy images and that's what we'll, we'll be doing pretty soon. So we'll come back to that in a moment. The CD drive as well. 
I don't have a physical CD drive in this machine, and a lot of people don't. So again, we're going to be using ISO images for whenever we need to connect something using the virtualized CD-ROM drive. And these are uh, the CD, CD drive is on the IDE bus, just like the hard drive here. So when I first power on this machine, it's probably going to give me an error unless I actually connect it to an ISO file. So I'm just going to not connect it at power on for now because otherwise we'll get some, some errors because it doesn't actually have a physical drive to attach to. So that's it for the virtual hardware configuration. So this thing's just about ready to start up. So when you're dealing with virtual machines, uh, at the beginning, you either have to give it an ISO file to boot from. I mean, you could do Pixie booting, but I'm not doing anything like that. But in the case of MS-DOS, DOS was provided on floppy disks. So I actually had the original disks that I created images from a while back. So this is the, the four disks uh, that are part of DOS uh, 6.22. The fourth disc, I guess, is the supplemental one that has some extras on it. Uh, so I have those available to use. The last one here that you see is actually the Windows 98 boot um, floppy. And I'll show you why I need that a bit later. But I'm actually going to steal the CD-ROM device driver from that floppy image because DOS doesn't include a CD driver and we'll need that to uh, get some ISO files pretty soon. Okay, so if I try to power on the machine right now, you'll see it'll basically just... Yeah, so it's giving me an error because floppy zero, and there's no device available. But if I just say yes so that it tries again, you'll see that by default it's just going to try to Pixie boot because there is no bootable, bootable disk or drive or anything in the system right now. The hard drive that's in this is just blank. So I'm going to go ahead and power it off. You can just right click on it, go to power, shut down guest. Well, actually, just power off. There's a difference between shut down guest and power off. It, it has to do with VMware tools, but you can't run VMware tools in DOS, so we're just going to power it off. And so what we'll need to do first is give it something bootable. So I'll go to the floppy, and I'll choose a floppy image file, which is going to be the disk one. So this is literally like I'm going to insert the MS-DOS 6.22 disk one into the drive. It's important that you have the connect power on button uh, checkbox checked up here because that means that it'll actually uh, try to connect it. And we'll just hit OK. And when I power on, it should be as if there's a floppy in the machine. And there you can, you can see now it says starting MS-DOS. And this is probably a very familiar screen to a lot of people. So I'm going to go ahead and hit enter. So just remember, we have a 1.8 gig virtual disk here. Oh, and actually I have to click into the window to sort of get focused and actually be able to interact with it. So if I hit enter, you can see it's found some unallocated disk space on the drive. So I'm just going to let it go ahead and, and partition and format it. So it's going to reboot now. So we want to make sure disk one is in the drive and it should still be when we reboot. And you can see it formatted it in like two seconds. <laughs> that was really quick. I'll just use all the defaults here. And we're gonna install it into C colon backslash DOS. And you can see it, it installed the first floppy disk in like two seconds because there's no limitations of a normal, you know, floppy drive controller and that sort of thing. So right now you'll probably notice that you can't move your mouse around. It's almost like your system's stuck in the DOS window here. So whenever you're using Workstation or any VMware product, it's usually control alt to get out. I believe Mac might be a little bit different, but yeah, just control alt and you should see your cursor reappear and now you can interact with workstation. So now that disk one's done, you basically have to change the floppy image to the second disk. So I'm just gonna go up to VM, removable devices, floppy and settings. And I'll just basically browse for disk two and hit open. And you gotta make sure as long as that connected checkbox is, is selected while the VM's powered on, uh, whenever as soon as I hit okay, it's basically gonna swap the, the disk image and it's gonna look like I changed the floppy disk that's in the, in the system. So hit okay. Again, click into the window to get focus and hit enter. And again, that took like two seconds. So I'll just repeat the process again for the third disk. Open and OK. It's probably the fastest DOS install I've ever seen, that's for sure. So another thing to keep in mind too, so now it we want to boot from the hard drive, right? So we're not going to um, leave that floppy disk image attached. So I'm going to hit Control-Alt and go back up to removable devices, 
floppy settings. You can hit the disconnect there, but that's only gonna disconnect it like as if you did that. The problem is the connected power on button is still checked. So as soon as it reboots, we're gonna have that problem there. So I'm gonna go ahead and uncheck that. So when you reboot now, it's not gonna try and boot from the floppy. So just hit okay and enter. And this time we should boot from the hard drive that's there. There we go. So it's like our first DOS boot up. And there we have it, just as if you installed DOS from floppies. All right, so now that we're in DOS, um, just like in the old days, there's really not a lot that gets configured by default for DOS. It sort of just assumes you have a machine with a floppy drive and that's it. But uh, obviously there's a few things we'll want to get set up. And the first of which is really CD-ROM access because we need to be able to mount ISO images. You're very limited to the size you can have for floppy images and you don't want to have to try and move files over that way. Um, but really the order of things that we want to do, we want to get the CD drive working. We want to be able to mount ISO images. We want to get the mouse working because by default in DOS, there's no mouse driver loaded and we can't use a mouse. We want to get the network driver loaded so that we can actually get this thing on the, on the LAN so that we can ultimately move files back and forth that way, which is a lot easier. And probably do some other tweaks too to make sure we have sufficient memory and, and everything's working okay. And a lot of those things are exactly what you would do with a, a normal DOS physical machine if you had a 486 or something like that. So the first thing we're going to do, uh, I mentioned before I had a Windows 98 startup disk. So I'm just going to mount that, that image and I'll show you the file I'm going to steal off of it. So if I actually, I could install the supplemental DOS stuff first, but I'm going to skip that. Not, there's nothing really that important on disk four, so I'll skip that. But yeah, the Win Windows 98 boot floppy image, and you can find this online if you if you search around. It's pretty easy to, to find, and I'll just make sure that it's connected. I'm not going to check the connected at power on button because when I reboot the machine, I don't want this floppy image to, to mount again. So I'll just hit OK here. And now if I go to the A drive, we should should be as if I inserted that disk. So the, the one file that I'm gonna want is the oak cdrom.sys file. So that's sort of a generic CD-ROM device driver. There are better ones. There's one called vide.sys, uh, which is a much smaller memory footprint than this one, but um, this is just easy to get and it works with just about any drive. So I'm gonna use this one. So to start, I'm just gonna make a directory on the C drive called drivers. And I'm going to copy oak cdrom.sys. And just remember, there's no autocomplete or anything like Linux and DOS. There are some utilities you can get that, that turn that on. I might show that later on. But right now, I've got to type everything out, unfortunately. OK, so that's uh, copied over there. And I'm just going to go back to the C drive. And there's two things we're going to need. So we need the CD-ROM device driver, which we, we just copied over. And we're also going to need MSCDEX, which is a, a DOS utility that uh, allows DOS to interact with the CD driver and uh, ultimately access the drive through a drive letter. So I believe MSCDEX is already in the DOS directory. Uh, oops, sorry. In the DOS directory. So MSCDX is already there. So what I'm gonna do is just edit, um, I'm actually gonna edit the uh, config.sys that's sitting on the floppy disk for the Windows 98 boot, just to get the syntax of the, the driver. Uh, so this is it here. So device equals oakcdrom.sys and then uh, slash d oem cd 001. That text string at the end could literally be anything. I've seen some funny things put there like banana and other names so you can you can use your creativity there but I'll just use the default name that's fine and I'll just go up to edit and copy and then I'll go ahead and open my config sys that's on the C drive that will be used when we boot this thing up and I'm just going to paste that here the only thing I'm gonna to have to change is the location of it because it's actually in the drivers location C colon backslash drivers and that should be good. So that'll load the next time the system boots. And the other thing we'll need to do is get is load uh, MSCDEX through the autoexec.bat file. And again, I'm just going to open the autoexec.bat on the uh, floppy disk. And you should see the syntax right here. Let's go to edit copy. And 
I'm going to open my autoexec.bat on the C drive again. And just paste it here. Now LH stands for load high. It's going to try to load this into high memory. Um, I don't have the EMM386 set up yet, so I'm just going to get rid of this for now. We'll come back to that later and do some memory tweaks. But for the syntax here, you need to know that the uh, slash D, the, so this text string has to match what was in the device driver when it loads. So OEM CD001 was the same, so that's great. And the slash L is for the drive letter. So it's just gonna associate the CD-ROM drive with drive D, which is usually what it is. So there's also the, um, the path variable here. So I don't actually have to put C colon backslash DOS here because MSCDEX is in the path. I'm just gonna add the driver's location that we copied over there as well. Um, just so that we technically could just launch things from that folder without having to um, specify the full path. I'm gonna do it here anyway, just you don't really need to, but probably best practice too, just in case. And that should be it. So the next time I reboot this machine, the CD drive should actually work. So let's go ahead and save, get out of here. And I'm gonna reboot. Another uh, quick tip as well. So whenever you're dealing with VMware products, uh, usually control alt delete, because if you hit control alt delete in your, your host system, my Windows 10 machine would respond to that. But there's sort of a mapping with control alt insert. So if I hit control alt insert in this machine, it's pretty much the same as if you hit control alt delete. So let's do that now and it's rebooting. Oops, so you can see here, this is actually, that's funny. I thought it would have disconnected the floppy. So this is actually the Windows 98 floppy image that booted up here. So I'll just go ahead and disconnect that. I guess because the machine didn't actually power off, it uh, it did that. So yeah, you can see the connected checkboxes there. So I'll just uncheck that, hit okay. And I'll just hit control alt insert one more time to reboot. Now we're booting from the C drive and there's the Oak CD driver, looks like it was good. Found one drive, and you can see MSCDEX loaded and it's uh, drive D is associated. So right now it's as if there's no CD in the drive, so if I go to the D drive, we'll just get a, uh, an error message. So let's go ahead and mount a CD image. So I'll just go over to removable devices, CD settings and just hit the use ISO image. So you can see I've got a ISO file already here called dosvm.iso. I created an ISO file with a lot of the uh, tools and things that I need just to save myself some time. I'm gonna put a, a link in the description to where you can get this. Um, basically inside of this file, you're gonna find, actually I'll just show it to you real quick here. There are a few things. So there's the Microsoft mouse driver, the PC Net32 packet driver, which is the network driver. This is the other CD-ROM driver I was talking about, just in case you wanna swap it out for one that uses less memory. This is actually a very good one. Uh, DOS Bench is, uh, Phil, Phil's Computer Lab has a, a great DOS Benchmark pack that uh, has a whole bunch of tools and some shareware games in it. So I included that there, because it's uh, useful to have. And also MTCP, which is an awesome suite full of uh, TCP IP tools, including ping, FTP, FTP server, uh, a whole bunch of things that are, are really useful for use in DOS. So anyway, let's go ahead and mount this CD image. And don't forget to hit the connected checkbox. I'll just check both of these. I'll let it connect at reboot as well. That's fine. And now if I go to the D drive, I should see all those files that I just, just showed you, which is awesome. So I'm gonna copy a few things off of this CD, um, namely the mouse driver first. And I'll just put all these things into the driver's uh, directory that I created earlier. I'm also gonna copy videcdd.sys. I'm not gonna use that now, but just for later. And the pcnettpk.com cpntpk.com to drivers. Oops, did I spell that wrong? Yes, I did. pcntpk.com. I missed my autocomplete, that's okay. And I'll also create a directory in the C drive called mtcp. And in DOS, you use xcopy to move uh, more than one file at a time. I believe it's dash E for all the directories, including empty ones, uh, TCP to C drive slash, well, I don't know if you need to specify the path, probably not, 
but just in case. And there we go. So copied all those files. And also DOSBench too. So I'll make a directory in C drive called DOSBench. X copy dash E. And there we go. Super fast too, because I mean, we're just dealing with ISO images that are stored on a, uh, a solid state drive in my host computer. So very fast, Didn't hard, hardly took any time at all. So the next thing we'll do is the mouse. Um, so if I run edit, this is a great tool just to check if your mouse is working. Uh, I'm moving my mouse around right now, nothing's happening. And that's because there's no mouse driver loaded. So I'll go ahead and uh, open my autoexec.bat file again. And we're going to load mouse.com, which is in the driver's location where I copied it. Oh, another thing we're going to do real quick here, just get rid of smart drive. So this is a, a tool that it was included in DOS 622 that uh, basically took some of your XMS memory in your system and used it sort of as a, a cache for your disk drive. Back in those days, you know, hard drives were 4,200 RPM or whatever they were with very slow access time. So it, it really did make a big difference in, in some situations. But obviously our system is so fast here, it's basically just wasting XMS memory. So I'm just gonna get rid of it. We really don't need this here. Okay, so I'll go ahead and save and exit. I'll go ahead and reboot too. I mean, I could just launch mouse.com, but let's just reboot and see how, how it does. CD drivers loading, and there you go. You can see mouse driver loaded. Another thing to keep in mind too, so VMware virtual machines, the mouse is not a serial mouse. It's a, a PS2 based mouse in older operating system types. I believe if you were to define like a Windows 10 VM or something, it uses USB or some of the newer operating system types. So that's more, more in line with what's modern these days. But uh, PS2 mouse is what you would get when you set it up for DOS or an older operating system. So if I just go to edit now, you can see I can move my cursor around and we have mouse support in DOS. So that's great. Okay, so the next thing we're going to get set up is networking. So if I go over to the MTCP location, this is where all of those TCP tools were. Um, actually, before we do that, I'm going to set up the driver. So if I go back over to the driver's location, uh, I just need to remind myself what the syntax is for the PCNet32 uh, driver. Again, remember with vir VMware virtual machines, there's several different um, network card types that, that can be emulated. There's an Intel E1000, there's the uh, Paravirtual VMX Net 3, which is what most modern operating systems use, and you get the best performance out of that one. But with legacy operating system types, like if you create a virtual machine and it's a very old OS type, the default uh, network adapter type is the, the AMD PCNet32. And the good thing is that it's so old, it's a 10 meg card from way, way back when, and it's so old that you know even DOS has drivers for it. So that's what that PCNet TPK, or sorry, PCNTPK.com uh, is. It's basically a packet driver for the AMD PCNet32. So if I just run it right now, I just wanna see if it gives me syntax for it. I think the only thing we have to define is the interrupt address, which is I believe a hex, hex value. And I think it's 0x60 by default. So let's try that. And I think you just do dash int equals 0x60. Let's see. No, I didn't do that right. One sec, maybe you just, probably no dash. Int equals zero x60. There we go, yeah, that worked. So you can see it reported my ethernet address down there, which is great. That's a virtual ethernet address that's associated with the virtual NIC in this. So that should be good. So I just need to use that same syntax in the autoexec.bat so that this loads when the system boots up. So we'll go ahead and stick that in there now. OK, 
Okay. So that should load when the system boots. So the next thing we'll need to do, um, keep in mind that with DOS, there's not really an underlying you know, network configuration page within DOS or anything like that. DOS doesn't really care. It just allows applications direct access to the NIC to be able to do what they need to do. And that's why the MTCP suite of tools is really useful because it provides a DHCP client. There's uh, DNS capability in it. There's FTP, ping, all the various tools you would need. And, and they interface directly with that packet driver that we just loaded. So if I go over to the MTCP location again, the first thing we'll need to do, um, so in the samples directory, there's a sample configuration file that needs to be loaded. So I'm gonna copy sample.cfg to the MTCP root directory here, and I'm just gonna call it mtcp.cfg. And I believe that file needs to be configured before any of the tools will work. Um, and there's an environment variable that's set so that you can use them. So if I launch DHCP, for example, to get an IP, it'll probably tell me, well, actually it'll probably work. No, it actually won't work because the environment variable is not there. So yeah, MTCP CFG equals file name dot extension. So I need to define that um, before it'll work. And I can do that just by doing set equals C drive. Uh, colon backslash mtcp slash mtcp.cfg, which is the file I copied over. And if I was to run DHCP now, it would work. But every time I reboot, I would have to put that in. So I'm going to add that to my autoexec.bat as well. Okay, and now when we reboot, that uh, variable should be set. So I'll just show you this config file really quick. Um, you can see for all of the, the, the various tools that are in here, you can see, well actually here's the packet driver, the interrupt that we're using, 0x60, so that's perfect. I believe that does have to match with whatever you set in your packet driver. Uh, you can set your MTU here, you can set your host name, uh, there's a bunch of FTP, uh, server parameters here that you can set, buffers, things like that, telnet stuff as well. Uh, but at the very end, you can see that there is this uh, list of IP address, netmask, gateway, name server, and a lease time. So whenever you run DHCP, it's actually going to write your IP here. But you can also put um, any kind of static IP address, uh, IP address, netmask, and gateway here as well as your name server, and it will work. You don't have to use DHCP, but um, I'm gonna use it. So I'm just gonna get out of here and we'll actually run the DHCP tool and see if we get a, an IP. There you go. So there's a, an IP address of 192.168.4.167, which is my home network. And you can see the settings were written to the config file. So if I just display the config file, you'll see it it at the bottom there. And it checks on the lease time as well. So if the lease time is short, uh, you sometimes have problems, but uh, any, any sort of normal lease time is fine. I believe if the lease uh, goes down too, too low, it'll force you to run DHCP again before you can run any of the tools. So let's just see if that works. So from DOS, I'm gonna ping 8.8.8.8 and it should be working. Yep, it is. So we now have network connectivity to our DOS machine, which is awesome. So what I like to do, I'm not gonna show you how to do it here, but otherwise this video is gonna get a little too long, but I like to run the FTP server with full access to the DOS machine. And from your Windows machine or whatever uh, host client machine you have, you can actually access the file system, copy over large files. It's so much easier than having to use, you know, all of these custom CD images that you create to move files back and forth. So it really is useful for that purpose. So that's basically it for the networking. I'm just gonna reboot the machine real quick and make sure, actually, before we do that, um, one thing I didn't do yet is add the DHCP to autoexec.bat so that it will try to get an IP as soon as the machine boots up. So I'm just gonna add that here. 
And that's it. So after it loads the packet driver, it will run the DHCP utility to pull an IP and write it into the file. So let's save. And I'm going to reboot right now and just make sure all this works. There you go. And it did work. And we've got an IP. I noticed there's a, an error about trailing white space in the file. I didn't modify the file, so it must just, just be there. We could probably clear out line 23 just to uh, get rid of that. Get, uh, I mean, get rid of the white space at the end. But yeah, that looks good. Now, the um, the only thing that's going to be a problem right now, so we, we loaded a lot of drivers here. So we've got a mouse driver, a CD driver, a uh, network card driver. At this point, our conventional memory might actually be getting a little low. So you can see we've got only 522k free of conventional memory. So there's a couple of different ways we can go about dealing with this. Um, you can do it the manual way. You can load the EMM386 uh, driver to provide yourself with some upper memory uh, area so that you can load your drivers and some other things there. That'll free up quite a bit. Um, you sort of want to shoot for around 600k of conventional. That was always sort of the goal back in the day. But um, I'm going to actually use the MemMaker tool in DOS 6.22. I usually do this manually, but I haven't run this in a long time, so I'm very curious to see what it'll do. I expect that it will um, uh, just go through these, the startup files, the config.sys and the autoexec.bat, see what can actually be loaded into upper memory and then make the changes for you. Um, but I remember running this a lot back in the day before I knew how to do everything manually, but yeah, let's do it anyway. Let's just see what happens here. So let's continue. And we'll do the express setup. So EMS memory, yeah, EMM386 by default will load uh, EMS memory. There are a few programs and games that don't like EMS, so if you don't really need it, you shouldn't use it. So I'm gonna say no here. By default, uh, all of your memory above 640K is XMS or expand, uh, is it extended memory? Yeah, extended memory versus expanded memory here. So I'm gonna say no. And looks like it's looking for Windows, which I don't have. And it's gonna do a reboot. And yeah, I think it just asks you if the system did anything weird or there were errors or something like that, so. But everything looked like it started up just fine. Oh, actually, now it's gonna do that, yeah. It's gonna restart now with the changes that it's proposing, and then it's gonna make sure that it started up successfully. So let's see what happens. That looks totally fine. So we'll say yes. Okay, look at that. So before MemMaker, 534K, now we're up to almost 600. So very good. And yeah, enter to exit. So let's see what it actually did. Um, interesting, it actually says 582K here. But let's, yeah, so you can see there's 79K of upper memory now. And most of it is actually used. So if you do mem-c, it'll give us more information. Oops, it's a little cut off there. So what didn't go into upper memory? So it looks like the mouse driver and the PC Net32 both did not go into upper memory. Some, some applications or drivers can't be loaded into upper memory. I think the packet driver was one of them, but I'm pretty sure the mouse driver should have. Maybe there's just not enough space available. Yeah, it looks like there's only 16K free. So there are some other tweaks that we might be able to do, but you know, we're close to 600K free and that should really be enough for just about anything to run. So to me, that's, that's perfectly fine. Uh, let's just take a look at these startup files and see what it actually did. I expect that it loaded EMM386. Yep, and it did. And, the, and you'll notice here that it has the no EMS option at the end. You can change that to RAM if you do want the EMS memory. And it looks like, yeah, so DOS instead of high is now in the UMB. This used to say DOS equals high. Device high for setver, device high for the CD-ROM driver as well there. There's some additional options here like the dash L colon one. I, I can't remember what this does exactly, but I believe it's certain memory locations that it tries to load them into. But yeah, that definitely made changes that should help, that's for sure. 
just look at the autoexec.bat. Yeah, and also load high for the MSCD EX here. So yeah, that's cool. That definitely definitely worked. I haven't run that in a long time, so that was pretty cool. Um, usually when I do it manually, I mean, I don't I don't do any of this dash L stuff. It just LH. It, you know, the defaults are usually good enough to load it into high memory. So, all right, great. Okay, so I know I said 600k or sorry, 595k is good enough, but um, you know me, I'm I'm a bit of a stickler, so I'm going to go ahead and. Uh, try to load that better CD driver because we're so close to be able, being able to load mouse.com into upper memory. We just need about 1K additional free. So if you remember, I ha I copied over this uh, VIDE CDD.sys file, which is another CD device driver, and it's much, much uh, smaller in terms of its memory footprint. So I'm going to try to load this instead of the Oak um, driver and just see what we get and maybe we'll have enough to load mouse.com into high memory. Uh, unfortunately there is um, a lot of people who are you know running DOS rigs these days they use they don't use mouse.com this is actually a very old Microsoft mouse driver that uses a lot of memory as well. There is uh, something called cute mouse or CT mouse that is included with free DOS. It's actually uh, a much smaller uh, mouse driver. But unfortunately, whenever I try to run it within VMware Workstation, it seems to crash uh, and the VM restarts. So unfortunately, I can't use that one. But I'm going to try the, the VIDE CDD.sys because I haven't, haven't attempted that yet. And we'll just see if it helps. And I'm pretty sure that the syntax is the same. So we'll just give that a try and see if that helps. Um, I don't know if I need to modify that. I'm gonna get rid of this whole extended piece here just to keep it simple. And we'll see if we're any better off. And I'll go ahead and reboot. And there you go, it did find a CD drive. I, it, sort of disappeared really quickly, but I did see that uh, it looked like it worked. I'm gonna just mount the ISO real quick again, make sure it actually works, and then we'll see if if we're happy with that. So we already have a, a CD image mounted. So if I go to D drive, let's just make sure it works, and it seems like it's just fine. So what's the verdict? Did it save us any memory? Not a whole lot. Um, well, actually you can see that the CD, well, actually that makes sense. So the conventional memory didn't get freed up because we did load the CD driver into high memory, but you can see up above VIDE CDD.sys only uses 5K of upper memory now, so that's much better. So now we actually should have enough memory to put mouse.com into high memory as well. <clears throat> so let's try to load this high, mouse.com. And I'm gonna reboot one more time and let's see if we, get over 600K free, that would be ideal. All right, 612K, much better. So it's amazing, just, you know, something as simple as changing out a, a CD, CD-ROM device driver can, can make a big difference. And we still have almost 30K of uh, upper memory free, which is excellent. So we'll call that uh, successful memory management there. I'm quite happy with that. And let's uh, take a look at some other things. All right, so now that our machine is uh, ready to go, uh, let's talk about sound. So there are a couple of different uh, sound devices that can be emulated by VMware Workstation and other VMware products. Um, if you use like a modern operating system, it's gonna emulate some type of real tech HD audio device like you know what's included with a lot of main boards these days. But um, there is actually Sound Blaster 16 emulation for older OS types, and that's really what we're interested in here. And interestingly, just recently, uh, VMware made some pretty significant improvements to the Sound Blaster 16 emulation. And um, I believe that now you can actually do, you know, OPL3 uh, emulation as well as uh, there's some functionality too to, to get uh, MIDI out out of the virtual machine to your host machine so that you can use other synth synths to uh, play your MIDI music. So um, in my personal experience, Sound Blaster 16 with DOS, at least in 
uh, VMware workstation is a bit hit and miss. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but um, the main thing that you want to make sure is that you are using the Sound Blaster 16 virtual device type, and you can do that by looking at the VMX file, which is the configuration file for your virtual machine. And you can see here under the sound options, it tells you what uh, device you have and whether or not it's connected. So right now we're using Sound Blaster 16 and the dot .present option is true, so that means it is there. The good thing is that the emulation that VMware Workstation does uses the very common, you know, IRQ5, address 220, the, the sort of things that you would expect a, a real Sound Blaster 16 to, to use. And in fact, you can actually load like the SB Basic um, utilities and run diagnose and use the mixer, and, and that all seems to work actually. But the problem that I have is that quite often, you know, you'll get some sort of weird issue, like you'll you'll start a game. You might have digital audio, but there's no FM music. Then you'll quit and launch it again, then it'll be the other way around. Or sometimes you'll launch it and you'll get some distortion in the sound. So I guess it really it really depends uh, on the host machine too. I don't know if there's something weird going on with my Windows 10 install or my sound drivers that might be contributing to that. But it does mostly work. So let, let's go ahead and launch Doom and we'll just uh, take a quick look. So I've copied it over to the Doom directory, and this is just the shareware version. I'm just going to run setup really quick. And for the music card, we'll just select Sound Blaster with the port address of 220. For sound effects as well, Sound Blaster 220, IRQ5. The lower DMA is 1. I believe the higher DMA is uh, 5 if you do need to specify it, but in Doom you don't. And we'll just mix 8 uh, sound effects. And let's see if we actually get some sound. Yep, you can hear some MIDI music there. Let's see if the sound effects work. Oh, this time it actually worked great, so no problems there. So let's just start a game and see how it, how it actually plays. Now Doom is not speed sensitive, so you can see that it, it's actually quite responsive and it doesn't seem overly fast. It seems to be pretty good actually. Yeah, there's sometimes a little bit of delay with the sound effects, but not too bad. Yeah, I'd say this is actually quite good. All right. Now one thing you'll need to keep in mind too is that uh, some games do require the set blaster uh, uh, environment variable to be set. So if you recall, this is something pretty much everybody had to do back in the day. But you can see that I have blaster equals A220, I5, D1, H5, P330, T6 uh, specified, which is you know the common type of line that almost everybody puts in there unless you have uh, RQ7 or something set. But uh, if you do have a game that doesn't have like configuration for sound like Doom, uh, like Wolf 3D for example requires that blaster line to be set. So you can just add that to your autoexec.bat if you want to want to include that at every boot up. So anyways, that's uh, that's it for now. A um, couple of disadvantages, of course. Um, as I mentioned before, we're basically running with a really, really fast CPU in DOS, which is not ideal. There's a lot of speed sensitive games and, and applications out there that just won't run properly if they have a CPU clock that's, you know, above 200 megahertz or what have you. So that's something you'll have to keep in mind. Some things will work just fine, like, you know, Doom didn't have any problem whatsoever with a, a really fast CPU. But yeah, if you do run into those types of problems, DOSBox is definitely a better way to go. But anyway, it was a really interesting experience getting this set up it, within v, uh, VMware Workstation. I've been wanting to do this for ages and just never did it. So it was a good, uh, good experience. And I'm glad that VMware did include some legacy features, even in the newer versions, including improving Sound Blaster 16 compatibility. So that was, that was pretty cool. They do still care about some of these legacy OSs, even though they're not officially supported. So anyways, uh, hope you enjoyed the video. Please like and subscribe if you'd like to see more content like this. Thanks very much.